Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we're meeting um, and pay my respect to Elders past and present and also to any Aboriginal people who are on the line today. On the screen you'll see Scott McNaughton from the NDIA and our two um, Auslan interpreters, Christine and Celeste. Um, my name is Mary Sayers and I'm the CEO of Children and Young People with Disability Australia and we're the national representative organisation for children and young people with disability uh, in Australia. So thank you for participating today. Uh, we acknowledge that the COVID-19 situation or coronavirus as it's more commonly known has been incredibly difficult for all Australians and we know young people with disability and their families have been hit hard by the situation. So not only is it about concerns around infection, which has meant young people with disability and their families have been self-isolating because they may be at greater risk from infection, but we've heard from you that we know daily life has become so much harder. For those of you who are either enrolled at school, TAFE or university or have been working, um, we know the move to remote work or remote learning has been incredibly difficult and we've heard from you about this. We'd like to thank uh, the NDIA for partnering with us um, on delivering these webinars and to provide the latest and most up-to-date information for young people with disability and their families. This is the third webinar that we've uh, conducted over the last few weeks, um, each for a different age cohort. Um, and the um, other two webinars are available on our website for young children, as well as for school age children. So today, um, we're particularly targeting our information um, for children, oh, sorry, for young people who are aged 18 and above and their families. But if there's anyone on the line who's got um, younger children or as a younger person themselves, there'll be also general information that will be helpful to you. So we'd like to acknowledge the work of the NDIA who've been working so hard to adapt and be flexible in these unprecedented times and we look forward to hearing from Scott very soon. But just before we begin, I'd like to um, go through a bit of housekeeping if that's okay. So. If you could check your audio settings at the bottom of your screen to make sure your speakers are working well. The webinar also has Auslan interpreting, um, which you'll be able to see on the screen along with the speaker. And the session also has live captions and they'll be visible at the bottom of your screen. But if for some reason you can't see uh, them, click the CC button at the bottom of your screen um, to access the captions. And again, this session will also be recorded and available on our website in case you want to go back and listen again. If for any reason we drop off this webinar because the internet um, traffic is too high um, or other technology issues, please stay logged in um, and we'll be back up and running as soon as possible. So in relation to today and what we'll be covering, Thanks for sharing with us the questions that you asked when you registered for the webinar. And we've compiled a list of the top 10 questions that you've asked, particularly in relation to young people with disability. Um, we may not get it to all 10. I'm hopeful we have. We have every session to date, so I'm sure we will. Um, but you also may have new questions and um, we're really happy to take those questions. So if you see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A function um, and you're able to submit further functions. And we are, uh, sorry, you are able to submit further questions. And we do have um, a moderator who's online who can also help with those questions. Um, and also at the end of um, our top 10 questions, we'll be able to answer some of your questions. What we won't be able to do is to go into specific circumstances or specific issues that you might be having, um, but we can answer very general questions. Um, and if you, there is any specific or circumstance questions, you can still ask it in the Q&A um, and we'll provide that with your permission uh, back to the NDIA so that they can get in contact with you. 
And so please be patient um, as we get through your questions and, and try to get through as many as possible. And I'll continue to remind you to keep asking questions throughout the webinar. Um, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, from the National Disability Insurance Agency, the General Manager of National Disability, uh, sorry, National Delivery, uh, Scott McNaughton. And Scott has had a long and distinguished career in the public service, including working um, at the Department of Social Services, the Department of Human Services, and now the National Disability Insurance Agency. I also had the pleasure, and I said this last time, of working with Scott many years ago, many, many years ago, we won't say how many. Um, so Scott will be uh, providing a brief introdu introduction to how the NDIA has been responding to the COVID-19 situation. Um, and then we'll, um, he'll answer the top 10 questions and then we'll go to the Q&A section. So I'm now going to begin that um, uh, by welcoming uh, Scott and um, asking him to give us Great, thanks Mary and uh, lovely to see you again and uh, thanks for the opportunity of being here today. Uh, we've certainly been working closely with Mary and the team at CIDA, uh, such an important time um, to get as much information as we can out there to participants and families. And I would also just like to uh, um, apologise on behalf of our CEO, Martin Hoffman. Uh, Martin did the first of the seminars, uh, the webinars with Mary and team, but uh, unfortunately couldn't be here today, but I'm more than happy to be here and represent the agency and answer as many questions as we can get through. But certainly we understand that the COVID-19 pandemic is a pretty unprecedented and challenging time for all of us. Um, it's changing the way we go about our lives. We're spending more time at home. Our usual routines have changed. The way that we interact with each other, the way that we can and can't get around community has all been significantly disrupted because of this pandemic. And it's really important that we give as much information as we can uh, for people out there, for our participants, so that they can continue to access the display services that they need. Um, and if people can keep getting their supports now, um, hopefully, and we're starting to see a bit of this as, as the, the rules around physical distancing start to be relaxed, uh, that they can then get on and access their quality disability services like they used to before, before um, COVID-19. But it is really important, um, and I think this is a really common goal for all of us, that we're making sure that the health and safety of our participants, of our staff, of each other, of our families, uh, is, is our highest priority. And so we do have to listen to the authorities and governments around social distancing and physical distancing and doing the right things, because we do need to minimise the spread of this virus. Um, we've seen really good efforts around flattening the curve, as they say, but a little bit more work to be done, no doubt. So what's the NDA been doing around this? What's the NDA been doing um, to support people during this time? Um, so there's a number of things we've been responding to. One is to try and give as much information to participants as we can, and specifically about how they can use their NDA's plans flexibly to continue to access their supports. And I'll talk a little bit about this more throughout the webinar today. Um, the other uh, area that we've been doing some focus on is where we haven't been able to do a plan review of a participant for whatever reason, we're automatically extending that plan by 12 months. And that's a really important initiative because what it does, it provides certainty for people, uh, provides consistency that people can continue to access the supports that they need. Um, we've also made some changes to allow people to use their plans and budgets more flexibly. And I'll talk a bit about assistive technology in a moment. Um, we've also got a dedicated phone line as part of our national contact centre. So it's a COVID related phone line. Uh, you can press five when you call our contact centre. And there's a team of specialists there who can answer any of the questions that you might have relating to COVID, how to use your plan flexibly. We also have a team of planners there who can help with any plan adjustments that might be required because of the COVID impacts. Uh, obviously we've had to move our face-to-face -face planning to phone-based planning. So first plan, plan reviews, uh, all of those contacts that would normally have been done face-to-face -face are now being done over the phone. And we've had pretty good feedback around that, really making sure that there's still quality interactions, even though they're not face-to-face, -face, and that people are still access, able to access a good quality NDIS plan so that they can get their supports. Another thing we've been doing is uh, reaching out to around 62,000 of our more vulnerable participants 
So we're phoning them, we're checking in to make sure that they've got the right supports in place, they've got the right information, that they're staying safe and well during this time. The other thing, and some of you uh, out there listening today might have already have, uh, had this opportunity, but as we're working with participants to review their existing plans, we're offering participants to extend their plans for up to 24 months, which allows even greater certainty and continuity of supports for participants without having to come back each year for an annual plan review. So again, a lot of people are taking up that offer. I just want to briefly mention uh, online services and technology because we've, we've heard a lot of really good and positive ways in which service providers have been adjusting how they're delivering supports during the pandemic. As they've had to move away from more face-to-face -face supports, we're hearing providers doing a range of really good online things like online therapies, online dance classes, um, therapy in the home via smart TVs, Zoom therapy sessions, all sorts of activities where they're staying connected to participants through those online services, which, which is great. It's really good to hear those, those uh, changing practices, but people can still access the services. But in response to that, we've also made and introduced a new policy that allows people more flexibility within their plans to purchase low cost assistive technology items up to $1,500 uh, which will help participants maintain their supports. So if they need access to a device, an iPad or a tablet device, and the provider says they need to access their services, they can use their funding for up to $1,500 to access low cost assistive technology. Usually that'll be up to around $750 as a cap for each device, but uh, nonetheless, that should get, get people a pretty good standard uh, um, device nowadays. So they can keep accessing their digitally supports that they might require. Because staying connected, we know staying connected is really, really important. And even though people are physical distancing, doesn't mean you can't stay connected with your family, your friends, and your support providers are really, really important there. Um, so uh, really, really good to hear that people and providers are doing some innovative things in this space. So I know there's a lot of questions to get through, so I'll just sort of um, wrap up in summary, Mary, that uh, I just want to reassure people that if you or your someone you care for, their support needs have changed because of COVID or whatever reason that is, um, you should be contacting your local area coordinator or contacting us and we can talk through your plan, how to use it flexibly. If need be, we can make adjustments and do a review of your plan to make sure you've got the right funding in the plan. There is a 1800 number, a dedicated 1800 number with a um, COVID hotline within that number. So you can call our 1800 110 800 number and press five if you want to talk to someone about COVID. You can, of course, as I mentioned, talk to your local area coordinator or if a younger, a younger child under the age of six, talk to their early childhood partner. We've got a specialist team of planners who can help make any adjustments to plans, as we mentioned, and, and give you that advice about how to use your plan more flexibly. Um, so I think there's some really important messages, Mary, that uh, everyone out there should, should follow and listen to. Um, and stay connected to our website. We've got a range of frequently asked questions. We update them daily. Uh, and they're in response to common questions we're hearing from um, participants, from carers, from families, and of course, providers. Um, so we're here to help give as much information as we can. It's a very difficult, a very challenging time for all of us. Um, especially people with disability, and we want to make sure they're getting the right information and support. So once again, thanks, uh, Sida, for inviting India to participate today. And I'm sure you've got lots of questions there, Mary, you might want to talk through. Terrific, and thank you for that um, opening, Scott. Um, the first question, we've got a number of people uh, on the webinar who may not yet be NDIS participants. And um, the first question was, how can I get NDIS funding with the current pandemic restricting assessments? Yeah, thanks, Mary. It's a really good question. Um, I just want to assure people that the way people can access the scheme uh, hasn't changed. Um, so you can still submit an access request to us. You can still contact our 1800 number and do, do what we call a verbal access request over the telephone and the team there can talk that process through with you. And uh, just recently we've made our access request form and our supporting evidence form available on the internet. So people can now download that form. And in fact, in the first couple of weeks, we've had over 3000 downloads of the form, which is, which is fantastic. Um, practitioners, GPs, specialists, allied health therapists, they can all download the form 
uh, or you can out download the form, complete it and email it to your therapist or specialist who can complete that and get that back to us. That can then be emailed or posted directly to us uh, and we can review your application, contact you if we need any more information, otherwise we can, we can process that. Um, so that's been a really good initiative, uh, as well as, of course, as I mentioned, contact the 1800 number, contact your local area partner, uh, a local area coordinator. If it's for children under the age of six, we encourage people to go through our early childhood partners who can explain how the early childhood pathway works, of course. Um, but just want to really reassure people that they can continue to test access to the scheme. Um, you can lodge it uh, or start that process via a number of ways. Um, and if you're not sure, the easiest thing to do would be to contact us via the 1800 number and we can guide you through that process. So um, no change, really important that if you, you know of someone who you think might be eligible or you may be eligible, you want to uh, get more information about eligibility that you contact us and we can explain that for you. Terrific, thank you very much, Scott. Um, and obviously it's really important that people, if they uh, want to apply for the NDIS, that they continue to do so, even though um, it is such a difficult time with the COVID situation. Yeah. So thanks for mentioning around the assisted um, technology items um, that are, are now, because many of the participants who are in this age category, either young people with disability or families um, of, young people, many may be self-managing their NDIS supports. And I, I was wondering if you could perhaps explain a little bit more about how people um, apply for the, um, uh, to get the assistive technology um, and what it means for self-management, uh, self-managed participants. Yeah, th thanks, Marilyn. I'll give a bit more clarity around the, the, the policy itself and then the application process. So as I mentioned, it's really great to hear from providers and participants about how they're doing more things online so they, ha they can stay connected with their disability supports. That's really important. Um, hopefully, people will be able to get back to face-to-face -to -face over time, um, but it's really important that they continue to access those even if they are through those telepractice or online or Zooms or those sorts of, those sorts of mechanisms. So um, in order to do this uh, and help participants receive, continue to receive their supports, uh, we've temporarily broadened our policy around purchasing low-cost assistive technology, and Minister Robert announced this in late April. So participants can now use their existing funding to purchase low-cost AT, uh, if that device will help maintain their connection to their supports. So people will work with their provider, their provider will confirm with us that the, the person needs uh, access to this technology and, the, and their provider's delivering that service online. And then participants already have flexibility in their plans to access up to $1,500 in low cost assisted technology items. That can be a range. It doesn't have to be an electronic device. It can be a range of, of AT related items. Um, however, most people won't need to spend more or shouldn't spend more than $750 on an electronic device. And this is in response to a lot of therapists and a lot of work we've done uh, with various suppliers that look a good a good um, mid-range mid tablet device is, is around $600 or up to $600. So you'll be able to easily get a device for up to $750 and then people can use the rest of that money for other assistive technology they may need. Um, to do that, what you do is you can use your existing core consumable budgets to purchase that device. So uh, people will have, majority of people have all got money in their core. Um, Last weekend, we made a change that, that made sure that the whole core budget was flexible besides the periodic transport budget, which allows people to move money around within core much more flexibly so they can access that. So if you're plan managed or you're self managed, you can purchase these uh, items from any provider. Uh, they don't need to be a registered NDA service provider. You can manage these from any, uh, any provider. However, if you're agency managed, um, you need to um, uh, purchase a device from an NDIS registered provider, uh, which is the same with any sorts of supports. But your, your support coordinator or your therapist or your, um, um, your provider of those supports can help guide you about where you can purchase those devices. And look on our provider finder tool on the website. You can find a, a local provider registered with NDIS in your community who would be able to um, supply that sort of device for you. 
We do also, Mary, get a few questions from people about can we claim internet charges and data costs? Um, and uh, and it's, a really, it's a really good question, but I just want to clarify our position on this because it does continue to be the scheme's policy, uh, the agency's policy, that daily living expenses like grocery, like rent, like bills, uh, like internet charges, these are personal everyday expenses and as such, you can't use your NDIS funding for personal everyday expenses. Um, so, um, so this uh, this is uh, remains the policy of the agency that you can't use your plan on data, but you can use up to fifteen hundred dollar on the purchase of, of a device and, and AT equipment. Seven hundred and fifty dollars on an individual device as part of that. Terrific, thank you very much, Scott. And I might just pause here because we've had a few more people join us on the webinar who may not have heard the introduction. If anything that um, Scott's updating you on um, is prompting any questions, there's a and a function at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to put your questions in there um, and um, we'll be able to get to those at the end of um, our top 10 questions that we're going through today. So um, don't hesitate to put your questions in there. Um, um, and uh, we're moderating that, so um, feel free to do that. Um, Scott, you mentioned about flexibility, and thank you for updating about the additional flexibility that you've put in um, core plans. One of the common questions we get is, can young people with disability or families transfer funding from one funding line to another, which you've somewhat answered in terms of um, the core supports, you can swap between them, but between um, core supports to capacity building and to and from consumables. And I think that capacity building versus core supports one is a common question. Yeah, thanks, Mary. It is a common question. It's one of the sort of more regular questions we get through our National Contact Centre as well. Um, where we're at at the moment between the, the three parts of a participant's plan, your core budget, your capacity building budget and your capital budget, your core budget is the most flexible. So for the most part, you can use all of that funding flexibly, except for those participants who might have what we call a periodic transport payment. So that's a fortnightly payment for transport related costs. That's, that's not flexible. That gets paid into the participant's bank account each fortnight. But the rest of your core budgets are open, which means that you can move money around core consumables, core uh, any, other act, any other type of core budget within that space. And what we did just over the weekend for those of, to make that possible, we actually put a dollar in each of those budgets if people didn't have that already. And what that does, it frees up and opens up all of those budgets within the core for you to use uh, very flexibly across them. So that, that's really good. Uh, unfortunately, at this stage, you can't use and move capacity building into core without us doing a review of your plan. Um, this is something that we're, we are working on and, and thinking about doing more flexibility over time. But in the meantime, if a person has um, core, if they're starting to get very low on their core budget, but they have capacity building budget and they'd like to move it across, um, you need to contact us through our call centre uh, and we can talk about your options and if need be, review your plan to move that funding around. Um, we can't move that around without reviewing the plan. That's just how the system is constructed for now. Um, but it is something we're certainly doing. We're hearing from participants saying, I'd like to use more of my capacity building in core. Can you help me with that? Uh, and we're able to do a plan review, uh, talk to the participant, get their agreement and move that money around. Um, so um, contact us. That's why we've got that team of planners who are aligned to our uh, call centre, who can then uh, have that conversation with the participant and move that money around. Your, capa your capital building, your, uh, cap capital funds, they're not flexible. They're usually for a, a vehicle modification or a home modification or high cost capital such as wheelchair or other high cost assistive technology. So that's that's the intent of that, of course. Um, but it's more, more around the core budget that's most flexible. So if you do have uh, concerns that one of your budget items is running low, please contact us and we can give you some advice around how we can either review the plan to move money around or you can use it more flexibly where you can. Thanks very much, uh, Scott, for clarifying that. Um, 
The next uh, question really will be quite important for this cohort that we're talking about today and, and the young people who are on the line as well as the, um, their families, is around the transition for students moving from school to their post-school experience. We know this year has been a very disrupted year um, and many young people might be finishing year 11 and 12 maybe looking to um, transition um, either into educa further education or into work. Um, what additional supports or processes are being put in place to support the transition of students um, at this time and, and helping people understand their options? Yeah, it is, um, it's a really important year, isn't it? Um, and you know, my first hand experience of this, my eldest daughter is doing VCE. I got a text from her this morning when in Victoria here that they've said uh, year 12 students can go back. She was, she was wrapped. Um, we've had our ups and downs of homeschooling and VCE. So I know, um, I know very much firsthand how important this year is for, for people in the sort of later part of their school and thinking about their next steps. Um, and things like uh, university open day or TAFE or open days and things and career counselling, things that, that students this year really rely on, you know, haven't happened as much as they would like to. And I know that's increasing a lot of anxiety and concern. So, look, hopefully as schools start to return and some of the physical distancing rules start to relax, there'll be more and more opportunity for those. Um, but what I wanted to talk a little bit about is how important this is and the NDIA's response uh, because we do know what an important life event is uh, in terms of turning 18 or transitioning from school to work at whatever age that might be. There's a couple of things that we're doing uh, and we have in place. Um, first and foremost, we have, a, um, we have a, a support program or a support item within the NDIS. It's called the School Lever Employment Support or SLES. So it stands for School Lever Employment Support. I'll call it SLES um, from now on. So um, SLES is a support item that we um, provide for young people with disability to help with that transition from school to work. Uh, and this funding is designed to help create that pathway as people try and make that transition. But it really recognises that everyone's pathway is different and it might start at different times because people might leave school at different ages. People might leave school and go straight to work. Some might do vocational training. Some might need to do some other courses. Some might go to university, um, some might work with their family or in open employment or various things. So everyone's transition is different. This, this support item is to help with those transition. For some people, we really encourage this concept of this principle of trying and testing. So how you can engage through work experience in different ways, um, how you can try different ways of doing uh, employment and, and you know, testing what you might like to do in your life. But the other thing that the SLES program can provide support for is capacity building activities like developing team building skills or travel training or helping to keep time and social engagement in the workplace and building resilience for, for maintaining a job. Those sort of really important life skills are something that we're very keen to see part of that, that transition. So, um, if, you, if you're coming up to that age or stage in your life as people are moving from school to work, talk to your local area coordinator or us or our planners around the school leaver employment supports, how they might assist you to maintain that connection and, and you know, manage that really important time. Um, employment is a really important focus for the NDIS as well. Uh, late last year, the minister and board announced the NDIS employment strategy this is around increasing the number of NDS participants uh, into work, supporting those transitions, working with employers to increase their confidence and their ability to attract and retain and employ people with disability, uh, making sure that we're putting the right supports in people's plans and also making sure the agency and the public service is a good employer of choice for people with disability as well. So that it is a really big focus for us and something we want to continue to work with the likes of yourselves and industry and employees to make sure that we're providing opportunities for people to make that important transition. Um, so my key message on this, as well as a range of other Commonwealth government programs that I'm sure people have heard of, such as the Disability Employment Services Program, which is providing the over $3 billion over the next four years to help provide um, support for people with disability connect to employment. There's the Australian Disability Enterprises, the ADE programs that employs around 20,000 people in this country with more 
moderate to severe disability. And there's a range of other job access programs. And what we might do, Mary, is send you all that information and link that you can post uh, on, on the website. I'll make those connections to as well. Um, but my key message here is absolutely agree and understand the importance of this transitional period for people. Um, you need to talk to your local area coordinator, your support coordinator, or, or talk to us um, to make sure you've got the right supports in your plan to help with that important transition. Because it is really, really important to get this transition period right, and we're not acknowledging that everyone's transition will be different. So, um, Thanks, Scott. And um, we have had a question come in, and I, just because it's so related to SLEDS, um, I might not wait till the end. Yeah. But the question was, who provides the SLEDS service? And what sort of providers provide that? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's a range of providers uh, who are registered to provide um, SLEDS type supports. Um, and really that can um, change depending on who, what area you're in. I'd encourage you to have a look at our provider finder and you can look up school leaver employment supports and you can see the local employers who are doing that. They're usually providers who are really good at connecting people, understanding the transition to work type programs, understanding the need to build people's capacity, understanding local job markets and how they can work with participants around their personal employment journey. So people have got those sorts of skills are usually those who are in the market of SLES, but you can look up all your local SLES providers in our provider finder tool. Terrific. Thanks very much, Scott. And um, certainly if anyone um, is on the webinar who hasn't um, looked into this, we're, we're certainly happy to um, direct people to the right information. This one is related again to education and, and we know that many um, young people with disability are still in school or in um, TAFE or in other um, educational programs. Can the um, NDIS funding used um, be used to flexibly support the transition back to education as schools go back to, uh, or education providers go back to more face-to-face -face or in that transition? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Another good question. Very topical, especially as we're seeing schools across the country, uh, state governments across the country make decisions around that, that transition. And they're all at different stages. Um, we know that schools are responsible for ensuring that all students are transitioning back to school, uh, as well as providing online education. The transition period is really important. So really encourage parents out there and students out there to talk to your teachers around those transition arrangements. Um, and our priority, uh, is to make sure that people continue to get access to their right to school supports to help with that transition. Um, and if that, some of the things that we're hearing um, is the around parents using uh, funding within their plans to get support workers uh, to help with their disability support needs with it while they're at home, uh, with any of those transition capacity building activities to help with uh, transition to school. Of course, it becomes the school's responsibility for once they're in the school settings but certainly support workers and providers can work flexibly with participants around the supports they might need at the home, around capacity building to help with any of their immediate needs or any of their transitional needs. So really important. Um, it will create uncertainty transitioning back to school. Um, for some people, it means back onto public transport, um, back into traveling to and from school. Um, we know that can create some anxiety. So really talking to your providers, talking to your teachers, talking to your uh, therapists and others who are engaged as part of your plan to help minimise that anxiety and work out what supports you might need to help with that transition. Fantastic. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Scott. And just a reminder to everyone on the line, uh, please keep sending your through, questions through to the Q&A. We've got some good ones um, coming up, so feel free to uh, Put your question in there. There's no question um, that's uh, too small or too large. So um, put it in there and we'll do our best to answer. Um, Scott, the next question is about um, housing in terms of supported independent living. And um, this comes to the COVID-19 situation directly and what um, a, a supported ind independent living we often call SIL, and so I'll use the SIL acronym. What additional responsibilities do SIL providers have in regard to hygiene and meaningful activities in light of the COVID-19 situation? And how can um, we be assured they carry them out? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Really important that we um, 
you know, provide good assurances for participants who might be residing in SIL as well as their family members and carers. Um, the National NDIS um, Quality and Safeguards Commission has been doing a lot of work with providers, providing regular advice and information around their requirements to deliver quality services and supports for participants. Um, and we do know that participants who are residing in support, supported independent living, uh, their support workers, they may often come in quite close contact with them. And so personal hygiene, cleanliness, protective equipment, minimising that physical contact and unnecessary touch and body contact, really, really important. Um, so what um, the Department of Health and Quality Safeguards has done a lot of really good work on infection control, on proper hygiene and care during this time. Uh, and they've actually done a lot of online courses and information made available for workers and so forth. Really important also that providers have their own infection control plans in place, that they have their own hygiene standards and they're following those through. Um, accessing PPE where they need to, uh, through either their own supply or the medical stockpile, really, really important. And the other thing that the agency has done, we've done within the NDIA, uh, what we've done is created a new support item, which is available for SIL providers in the um, event, and, and touch wood, they don't need this, but in the event that a participant who's living in a SIL, into a SIL location, happened to contract, contract the coronavirus, um, what would happen is that the providers can then claim for the higher level of intensive supports, they can claim for professional cleaning and other supports that they might need to provide for members within the property, other participants who are in the property. So that's a new support item that we put in place. As I said, touch wood, hopefully people won't need to draw down on that additional um, support, but, but it is there, something we've made available. Um, really important. The other thing I just wanted to quickly mention, because we do know that some people who are residing in, in supported independent living aren't able at the moment to go and access their social activities or their day programs and other activities that we're doing in community because of physical distancing. Um, where the uh, SIL provider is steps up and provides some of these on an ad hoc basis, that'll be covered as part of the SIL quoting process or the SIL costs. But if that's becoming more regular, the um, provider of the SIL and the participant and their support coordinator can come to an agreement where that provider can start to claim some of those costs for making sure that they're delivering good community participation for the participants during the corona, uh, corona um, pandemic. So that is another opportunity to make sure people can still access community if their regular community participation providers aren't able to provide that information uh, or provide that support. So, so really important, getting back to the original question that providers are getting all the information they need from the quality and safeguards and Department of Health. They're following through their own infection control plans making sure their staff are following through their own training and got all the advice they need to ensure that they're uh, uh, doing everything possible to minimise the risk of infection and the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And look, Scott, there's a related question that's come through the question and answer line around, um, and I don't think this is just relating to SIL, but it's all disability support workers. Um, the question is, um, does the support worker have to wear PPE equipment while assisting them? It's a very, another really good question. Um, really encourage people to follow the advice of the Department of Health around when we should be using personal protective equipment or PPE. Because the evidence shows that not everyone will need to use PPE. It is usually those who are in close, regular personal contact with a participant or a person. Um, and there's some really good guidance. I'd encourage you to have a look at that uh, on the Department of Health's website. So what, what the government has done is made sure, and we heard in the first few months, and quite understandably across the world, there was a shortage of PPE equipment. And Australia wasn't immune to that shortage. Um, but what we've seen is increased supply, more people making PPE equipment now, which is fantastic, and more PPE is now available in the, in the country. We have what's called a national medical stockpile. Uh, and the government have set aside some of that stockpile for NDIS, for NDIS providers. 
Um, so that's up to 500,000 masks now available for the disability sector, for primary health uh, sector, uh, and also the NDIA and the NDIS providers. So I'd really encourage providers out there to, to get on, on contact the Department of Health if they need equipment, uh, need PPE, they can, con they can contact the stockpile through uh, via the Department of Health and get access to the, to the PPE equipment they need. Unmuted, uh, I'll unmute myself. Um, yeah, so I think the message you're giving is um, that PPE equipment uh, or personal protective equipment is now available um, fairly readily, readily for um, support workers and for, um, for people yeah, uh, with disabilities. Yeah. So thank you. Um, the next question um, is really important for young people with disability um, in, in terms of their social supports and, and obviously we've all been impacted by a loss of um, social supports um, or activities outside of the home, um, bearing in mind that um, physical distancing has had to happen. How is the NDIS um, helping participants to main, maintain social support networks at this time? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mary. Um, and it has been a big change. It, it really has been a very disruptive change for people about our normal routines, the way we normally connect with people. We've had to adjust um, and, and it's been quite challenging. Um, so really important that we try and, and stay connected. I like the language shift personally, um, that it wasn't about social distancing, it was about physical distancing. And, and the language is important here, but we really do encourage people to stay socially connected, even though they might be physical, physically distancing. So you can stay socially connected through all of those channels, you know, your social media, your phone, your emails, your, um, you know, talking to people over Zoom and Skype meetings and all those other ways and that we do that. So reach out to people, stay connected, check in to make sure that they're doing okay. Really, really important during this time. Within the NDIS, again, hearing some great things that providers are doing. Um, online dance programs, online cooking classes with participants, online therapy or gym type activities. Really good ways in which participants uh, with their friends online can be participating in a workshop like this uh, with their provider doing some really good activities. So um, reach out. If, if your provider isn't offer offering those type of supports, there are providers out there. Um, so again, check them out on our website um, through our provider finder or talk to your provider about how they can do this because we have seen dozens and dozens, hundreds of really good examples of how providers have offered online activities to keep people connected. So we think that's that's really, really important. You know, as, as governments start to relax these rules as they are, um, that's great, but you've got to do that in a safe environment, follow the rules. Don't rush out and, and you know, that's create second waves and things. Let's do it pro properly. But we just need to make sure we're maintaining those connections with people uh, as best we can. Terrific. Um, thank you, Scott. And certainly the ability to be outside and, um, and exercise um, outside and be outside with more than one person um, is really important. Um, right. And many of the, com uh, the states have been relaxing some of that because often it might be a family member, a support worker and a person with disability who want to get outside in the park together to do some um, outdoor activities. So certainly that should hopefully ease um, some of those connections in the yeah. next little while. Um, the next question really comes to reviews um, during this time and there has been some concerns um, about how reviews might change because of COVID-19. Could you perhaps outline that Scott? Yeah thanks Mary. Really good to clarify this um, because we get a lot of questions around my plans coming up for review, what's going to happen. So a couple of ways that we're supporting this Firstly, if for whatever reason we haven't been able to review your plan, we haven't been able to get in contact with you or, or whatever, there's been some other circumstances, your plan will not expire. It will automatically extend for a further 12 months, so you'll be able to keep getting your current supports. Um, so that's a really good change we've put in place uh, at the start of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic to make sure that everyone could continue to get their funding. What we are doing is we're also contacting participants and talking to them about their plan review options. 
for some people, they're really um, comfortable with their current plan, uh, and they're actually um, providing advice back to us that they'd like to just have their extent plan extended uh, as it currently is for another 12 months or even 24 months because they've got good stable supports, uh, they've got good informal supports around them, um, everything's going pretty well uh, in terms of their disability supports. So they don't need to come back in every year for an annual review. We, we know that can cause stress and anxiety. Um, so they can have a longer plan and they can get on with their lives and we'll keep regularly checking in on people, of course. Um, some people saying, no, I need to have a, a fulsome plan review. My circumstances have changed. Might be I'm, I'm now in my school to work transition or something else has happened in their life that, that's, that requires a full change of their plan or full review of their plan. So we're doing those full reviews over the telephone. So the planners or local area coordinator will book a time with you. They'll talk you through the options and they'll go through the full plan review, just like you were doing it in a face-to-face -face environment, except we'll do it over the phone because of the, the physical distancing challenges. Um, so look, there is no change to this. We wanna make sure that people continue to get their plans. We wanna provide people the opportunity to have longer plans if that suits them. And if for whatever reason we haven't been able to do your plan review, we're going to extend it for 12 months so you can continue to get the supports you need. Um, and we're getting lots of good feedback to them. And we're seeing more and more people actually, Mary, take up um, having longer plans, two-year plans or even three-year plans. And I think that's a good reflection that people are uh, now at a place that are pretty comfortable with their plan, know what they want to achieve over the next year or two. And they don't need to come back for annual reviews with us, but we will, as I said, check in with them along the way to make sure that things are going okay. Terrific, thank you, Scott. Do you need to take a breath? No. <laughs> been, yeah, and just a reminder to everyone, keep your questions coming. Um, we'll have a little bit of time at the end to ask some questions. Um, and so feel free if anything's cropped up that it's prompted a question to put it in the Q&A box. Um, the next two questions, the final two questions are around funding. The first one, you kind of touched on a little bit about what happens with funds that aren't used and will people be disadvantaged if they can't use a large proportion of their funds because of COVID-19? And there was a particular question that came up um, that was related to that around um, the SLEZ two year period as well, if they haven't been able to use their SLEZ um, because of um, the COVID-19 situation. So if you could answer perhaps that generally as well as potentially that question as well. Yeah, I will. I will, Mary. I'll cover both those off. The key message here is that you won't be disadvantaged. If you haven't used your funds because of COVID-19, because you haven't been able to access all the supports you would have normally accessed, you won't be disadvantaged when it comes to plan review. Because um, we know that some services have stopped or changed or um, people might have liked the online um, therapies but they had shorter therapies rather than longer, longer online sessions. So they're not using as much of their budget. Maybe in the back half of the year or the back half of their plan, they can increase that. But um, you know, we understand that's been a very normal occurrence as part of the COVID-19. So what we do at, at the plan review is have that conversation. Uh, we understand what's happened during COVID. We, we, we all know we're all living through it. Um, so what we really do is just make sure that you've got your ongoing support you need the disability related supports you need. Um, it's not about what you haven't spent, uh, it's about what you need moving forward. Um, and uh, as I said, that's why one of the reasons we are extending plans for longer periods of time, so people aren't having to worry about um, having that, you know, the anxiety that's caused. Now for SLES, exactly the same response. We know that's a 10 year period, a two year period um, around the um, SLES funding. If you haven't been able to access that, because we know We've probably lost a few months this year in terms of what we all would have liked to have been doing uh, to some extent. Um, so there won't be any issue with that. If we need to extend that a little bit further um, to make sure we can catch up later on, then that's the conversation we'll be having with our LACs and planners around that. Terrific. And the, the last question before we go to our general Q&A was around the decision um, that around the 10% price increase that service providers can now charge. And we understand that that was um, to help service providers in this really difficult time. Um, but some of the participants are worried that their plan is being used up more quickly because of the 10% COVID price increase, but their plans were not increased. So what can they do about that? Yeah, just want to really reassure 
participants, Mary, that um, if if their plan is getting used up because of that 10% rule or 10% price increase, I should say, um, if we need to review a participant's plan to increase their budget because of that, we'll, we'll review the plan to increase their budgets. Generally, most people in the scheme don't spend 100% of their plan each year. Um, so we think there is some flexibility anyway because of this time limited 10% um, loading and cancellation fee change. So we're hoping that uh, it won't require or people won't um, spend all of their plans because of that. But if they do, as I said, uh, contact us uh, and we'll talk you through the options, including increasing your plan if we need to because of that 10% loading. So no, people won't be disadvantaged because of that. And we just reassure participants out there that that's, we're, we're very conscious of that. Hopefully, um, you know, you, you'll be able to absorb that within the, the context of the plan overall. Uh, we expect most people will be able to do that. Um, but if not, then we'll um, talk to you about reviewing their plan to increase the funds to cover that. Terrific. And, and I guess there was some concern from self-managers as well who, um, who their support workers were not eligible for JobKeeper as well. So the message I'm hearing from you is um, if people's plans are starting to be fully utilised because of that, to get in contact with you um, and that um, the agency understands this issue. Yes, contact us and we can talk through those circumstances with you for sure. Fantastic. Um, another question um, that we had come up on the line. So we've finished our 10 questions. Um, so thank you, Scott. That's a hell of a lot of information to get through. And we have still got some questions to get through. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, but we are, we'll be working with the agency after these webinars to feed back the questions so that, um, as Scott mentioned, that the FAQs can be updated and so people can continue to get um, information that they need. One of the questions was around how the NDIA is working with the local area coordinator partners to make sure that they're fully abreast of the changes that you're making centrally and what sort of when um, there may be a difference between what the LAC says and what the um, what the, your information on the website says. Yeah, thanks, Mary. This is something we, we invest a lot of work in this, our local area coordinator partners our staff in the National Contact Centre to make sure they've got all the latest information. Admittedly, information is being updated fairly quickly in the, in the COVID response. We were responding almost daily with new frequently asked questions. We published that out to our local area coordinator networks, our contact centre staff, as well as all of our planning staff across the country. Um, so they've got access to all the same tools, all the same inf information on our intranet, frequently asked questions, all the same resources um, so that they can get that information. If there's a big change, uh, what we will do is we'll bring all of our local area coordinator partners together virtually in a big forum like this, and we'll talk through the change. Uh, and we did this, say, uh, with the changes to the assistive technology for argument's sake is a good example of that. So these are the sorts of support, um, um, strategies we're using to make sure our local area coordinators have the same information as our planners, our contact centre staff, etc., so that we can all have the same message. Um, if, if there are challenges, um, talk to your local area coordinator, contact us at the contact centre and, and uh, we can clarify that for you. Fantastic. Thank you, Scott. There was a, another question about the capacity and the core. So you mentioned that you couldn't move funds from capacity building to core. Can you move it the other way from core to capacity building was the question. Yeah, good question. Um, at the moment, uh, we're not able to do that the, unless we do a review of the plan. So you, you don't have flexibility to move your core into capacity without contacting us, uh, talking to us, our local related coordinator partners or our contact centre, we can then talk through your options and then talk about if we do a plan review with your agreement to move that money. Um, it, you, you, you can't actually do it without a plan review. Okay, no, thank you for, for clarifying that. That was certainly a question. And we do have time for one or more um, questions if people want to um, answer anything in the Q&A. And I guess um, one of the things, Scott, I'll take an off the record um, or on the record is what have you found... Um, 
I certainly have found in this time, you know, the joys of working with people online. And what have you found um, that's been valuable for you during this time in your work? Yeah, it's, um, it's been very, very interesting. I think one of the things that we're really proud of as an agency is we've been able to continue to provide um, good quality service to participants, um, reaching out to the 62,000 more vulnerable participants to check in on them, making sure we're still um, um, being able to bring new people into the scheme, um, make access decisions and first plans. Well, we've moved a lot of our workforce to work us from home as well. So we're really proud that we've been able to do that. I've become quite um, au fait at using Microsoft Teams and Zoom and things I've never heard of before, which is, which is really interesting. Um, and the one thing I've heard uh, and learned from my 80 year old mother is uh, nothing beats catching up for a cup of coffee. Um, uh, and none of this technology works for her at all, and I'm a bit old school like that too. So I think more and more as uh, we're allowed to get out across the country and connect with people physically, um, in, in the right constraints, of course, um, catching up and having a coffee or a drink or whatever you do with people, uh, I think we're all looking forward to doing that again. Fantastic. And look, just the last question that we've probably got time for is, um, can fund, and again, it's, this is about the flexibility and it might be the same answer as what we had. Um, can funding for capacity building, so improved daily living, be moved to capacity building, improve relationships without a plan review? So it's moving within capacity building. There is, there is not as much flexibility within the capacity building budget for that either. Um, there is the ability for support coordinators to use um, funding across those buckets a bit more flexibly, um, but it, there's not the flexibility for individuals to move that money around um, as much as we would like to. These are things we're considering moving forward, how we can create more flexibility, but at the moment uh, there's not as much flexibility for that as we would like um, and that we hear that participants are asking for. So, um, But you can talk to, if you've got a support coordinator, you can talk to your support coordinator who has some ability to um, claim against different line items in those budgets. Terrific, thank you. And we've fired some pretty difficult questions at you today, Scott. So um, thank you very much um, for providing that feedback. And uh, thank you um, to the agency for all the work you've done. And, and I think if a key message that I've got from you today, Scott, is if you're at all concerned, get in touch with your local area coordinator get in touch with the agency um, and there's a, that special COVID um, number. Could you perhaps repeat that COVID number again? Because I can't remember it, just so people have got that. Yes, it's 1800 800 110 and you press 5 for COVID. Terrific. And, and thank you very much. I'd also like to thank um, Christine and Celeste, who have been our Auslan interpreters. Thank you very much for your assistance today. I'd like to thank Helen, who's online doing captioning, um, but also thank all of you for um, registering for today's um, webinar. The agency has been getting our feedback very regularly and we'll continue to work with them to make sure that any questions you've got um, can be answered. So thank you very much again, Scott. Thank you everyone uh, for being online. And don't forget, that, um, if you want to listen back to this, um, it will be uh, online on CIDA's website in the next 24 hours. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. Bye, everyone. Thank you.